Welcome to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, our Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And check out our YouTube archive, youtube.greatdetectives.net. A reminder, as you make your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate, so you get all the benefits of going to priceline.com. But part of your purchase price benefits the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, we begin the Bob Reddick era in uh, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Reddick had the shortest tenure of any Johnny Dollar actor. And by all accounts I've read, he was always attended as a bit of a stopgap until they came up with a permanent uh, replacement. And he was only on the show for 28 weeks. Reddick was never a major star. He was the son of Frank Reddick. Uh, Junior, who was the laugh of the shadow. He performed on Broadway as a teenager in George Washington Slept Here and All in Favor, and did a bunch of uh, scattered radio acting over the years. But I think, uh, from what I've heard, is uh, Johnny Dollar is pretty good, and I, I hope you uh, enjoy it. Well, let's go ahead and take a listen to Bob Reddick in Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar from December the 4th, 1960. This is the Earned Income Matter. Johnny Dollar. Toby Tedrick, Johnny, over here at Northeast Indemnity. Well, good for you, Toby. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Just that I always have liked the nice big fees that that company of yours hands out on cases. It just happens that I can use one of them right now. I've been running a little short. And I don't get excited, Johnny. Now, what is it this time? Murder? Arson? Embezzlement? Well, it's... Oh, come uh... on, come on, Toby. What is it? Well, as a matter of fact, it's a robbery. Well, fine, fine. If I'm lucky, if I latch onto the loot, whatever it is, I'll collect my usual commission and be loaded again. Uh, Johnny... So tell me all. Now, what's the amount of the loss, huh? Well, that's the trouble. It's only $5,000. 5000 Cash. Well, it was only... Oh, are you kidding me, I hope, huh? Nope. Sorry. That's the full amount. Oh, now, look, Toby, that doesn't make sense. Robbery never makes sense. Well, how much of a commission can I possibly pick up on a loss of only five Gs? Johnny... Now, I don't mean to sound money-hungry. Oh, of course, I really am. But uh, look at it this way. If I tie myself up with this piddling little case, I might have to pass up something really lucrative. Listen, Johnny, it happened right here in Hartford. And it just happened. And from what little I know about the circumstances, it ought to be a lead pipe cinch for you. Oh, sure, they all are. Yeah, but if you're not tied up with anything else at the moment... Oh, come on. At least take a cab on over here and talk about it, huh? Okay, Toby, just to keep you happy. CBS Radio Network brings you Bob Reddick in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Northeast Indemnity Associates, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the earned income matter. On only a $5,000 loss, I wouldn't even dare to put in too big an expense account. However, I wasn't kidding. I could use some extra dough. But as long as I didn't have anything else to do, all right, take it on. Item one, $1.20 for a cab into Toby Tetrick's office. At Northeast Indemnity. Well, I guess it was kind of thoughtless of me to have you come right over here, Johnny. I should have sent you straight to Mercy Hospital. Well, I can't imagine why, Toby. I'm feeling fine. Now, come on, Johnny. I'm serious. I want you to go over there and see this client of ours. His name is Philip Standish. Now, what's happened to him? I thought this was a robbery matter. Well, it's this way, Johnny. Standish lives at the Ashley Arms apartment alone. You know the place? Yeah, I know the place. Well, early this morning, while he was still in bed, somebody broke in, bashed him over the head, and walked off with his $5,000. $5,000 in cash lying around his apartment? That's kind of silly, isn't it? Well, he thought he'd had it pretty well concealed, Johnny. Where? 
On the wardrobe in his bedroom. Now, don't you mean in the wardrobe? No. Right on top of it. Right out in plain sight. Now, look, I've heard about the most obvious place being the least likely place to find something, but isn't that a little ridiculous? Five thousand bucks? No, no. What I mean to say was the urn was in plain sight. The urn? Yeah. You know, one of those heavy bronze cremation, uh, that is, funeral urns, the kind they use to keep somebody's ashes in after that somebody's been cremated. Kept the money in that. I see. Well, that's not such a bad idea, as a matter of fact. If it had a good tight lid on it. And it did, with a tricky kind of lock on it. Who'd ever expect a man to keep money in one of those things? I mean, instead of the ashes of a dear departed relative or something. Well, evidently somebody did. But the question still remains. What question? Why under the sun keep that much cash lying around? Well, what sort of business is he in? Well, Standish, he was... you say his name is? Yeah, that's right. Philip Standish. Mm-hmm. The way I understand it, he has an interest in some sort of an import business down in New York. Art goods, novelties, furniture from the Orient. And he commutes all the way to New York? Well, only goes down there once or twice a week, I think. Anyhow, Johnny, the man's been beaten and robbed by somebody who got in through the open window of his apartment. He has one of those policies covering cash loss up to 5000 He's over there in a private room at Mercy Hospital, and he wants you on the job. So, if you have nothing else to do... Uh, do the police have any ideas about who may have done this to him, or is he... Why don't you run over there and ask him yourself? All right, Toby. Putting the bill. Uh, now, go easy on the expense account of yours, will you? For once... After all, it's a pretty small amount of money. Oh, but who knows, Toby? Pursuit of the missing five grand may lead me to the furthest corners of the earth. Why? To strange, exotic lands where never before has the white man set foot. Oh, where untold let's... dangers lie lurking in the jungle. Oh, oh, go on, you bum. Get out of here before you break my heart. <laughs> all right, Toby, I'll see you later. <laughs> Item two, 75 cents for a cab to Mercy Hospital. Philip Standish, a rather good-looking man of about 50, had taken a beating all right. The back of his head was taped up with a heavy bandage. There was a splint on one of his arms. But he was still very much alive. The police? No, Mr. Dollar, I want you to handle this. But why? If you were beaten and robbed, it's a police matter. But what can they do? That is, with no clue whatsoever as to the man who did this to me. The man. All I've been able to tell them is that somebody came into my bedroom through the open window, beat me up this way, then left with the urn containing the money. Then you've told them. Yes, of course. Do you expect me to run this man down for you? Oh, yes, I do. You're sure it was a man? Huh? Yes, of course I am. Because you recognized him, maybe? Yes, Mr. Dollar. You're sure? Absolutely. But that you didn't tell the police? No. Why not? Because it would only bring out... Bring out of my past something I prefer not to have known. It's something I wouldn't want to publicize. Keep talking, Mr. Standish. Well, now, this must be absolutely confidential, Mr. Dollar. All right. Uh, that, that's the reason I asked to see you. Go on. Well, 15 years ago, I I served a short prison term. Oh, what? Oh, it was a, a ridiculous thing I did. Utterly stupid, but... I, I signed another man's name to a check, and, well, I, I paid for it. I see. Now, my cellmate, while I was in prison, was a man by the name of Thomas Slade. Oh, Tommy Slade? What? Well, that kind of rings a bell. Now, what was he in for? Illegal liquor, narcotics, something like that? Wasn't he in the headlines sometime or other for shooting a man? Frankly, Mr. Dollar, I don't remember. He was a tough and dangerous sort, though. I see. And I remember that one day in our cell, we talked, among other things, about... About places to hide the, the loot from a job. You plan to resume a career in crime after you got out? Oh, good heavens, no. But uh, that's all the people in a place like that talk about. Crime. And, uh, past and possibly future. Go on. Well, anyhow, it was Slade who suggested this funeral urn. A place even an experienced criminal would never think of or want to tamper with. And so, ever since I got out, that's where I've kept whatever money I've had. Friends, uh, people who've seen it have suspected nothing, have sympathized over my loss of a dear one. And I've encouraged that illusion. Why not keep your money in a bank? Well, that's silly of me, I know, but ever since the foolish thing I did with that check, well... Suppose you were to accumulate a real sizable sum. Well, to be honest about it, there is considerably more than 5000 in that urn. Well, the insurance only covers it to five. Right. Now, I must have it back, Mr. Dollar. And if you can get it for me, I'll pay you far more than your insurance company will. Well, now, that's an inducement. <laughs> Frankly, I thought it would be. Oh, oh. What's the matter with him? Well, my 
My head doesn't feel too great. Yeah, you take it easy. Uh, now, you figure that Tommy Slade is the only one likely to know that that's where you kept your money? Oh, I'm sure of it. I'm also sure that, although I've tried to avoid him over the years, he's kept track of my whereabouts. All right, now how to find him? Well, it shouldn't be too difficult. Hmm? He lives in Los Angeles, in West Los Angeles, California. Oh? His address is, uh, uh 1308 Pandora Avenue. Now, I know that section of L.A. pretty well, Mr. Standish. You think he'd simply haul that urn back out there? Well, why not? You know that if I were to pursue him or alert the police, it would only give him opportunity to bring up that part of my past that I've tried so hard to live down. Wouldn't he be more likely to simply yank the dough out of the urn and then oh, toss no, it away? No, 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 no. In the first place, it will take him some time and skill to find the clever way in which I've locked in the threaded plug in the top of it. Now, even so. And knowing Slade... I'm certain he wouldn't risk giving away the secret of the urn by letting some mechanic or machinist open it up for him. Now, don't forget, Mr. Dollar, that if the police have given this robbery to the papers, anyone seeing the money in that urn would spot him immediately as a thief. You have a point there. What's more, certainly no one would try to steal a thing like that from him. So he has no worries about the safety of the money. I suppose you're right. But somehow, Mr. Dollar, you must find him. Get that urn away from him and bring it back to me. As I said before, I'll make it very much worth your while. Okay, Mr. Standish, I'll see what I can do. Wish me luck. <laughs> Expense account item three, another six bits. This time for a cab to police headquarters. There I asked Sergeant Jimmy Wormser if he could somehow get me a flyer on one Tommy Slade. Oh, well, what's the matter with this one right here on the top of my desk? <laughs> It'll do fine. How come, Sergeant? Well, it came in with a little note from the boys out on the West Coast one day last week. What, he's on their wanted list out there? No, no, no. The note just said he was headed this way. On account of his record, the boys in L.A. thought we'd like to keep an eye on him while he's here in Hartford. Oh, did he arrive? Yeah, and we kept an eye on him. But all he did was fool around for a couple of days, and uh, he did pay a visit to the uh, Department of Health. Oh, why? Well, something about a permit to carry somebody's remains back to California. Now, what do you know? And would you say this picture is a good likeness? Yeah, perfect. Good. I'm sorry I can't let you have it, Dollar, but I think we'd better keep it here in our files. I can have a photostat made if you like. No, 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 that won't be necessary. But if you've been keeping tabs on him, where will I find him? Oh, well, that's a good question. You like train rides? Train rides? Yeah, that's right. Mr. Tommy Slade bought himself a reservation to New York and a berth on the Starlighter Express to Los Angeles just this morning. And then he's already left town. Well, not more than a couple of hours ago. But if you grab a plane down in New York... All right. Get... Thank you very much. Oh, now, wait a minute, Dollar. What's your interest in him? You know something, Sergeant? I'm not absolutely sure. What? Not yet, anyway. The more I thought about that picture of Tommy Slade, the more certain I was that somewhere, sometime, our paths had crossed before. Item four... 6.50 for a fast, and I mean fast, taxi out to Bradley Field. I was lucky. So item five is $8 even for a plane to New York that took off almost immediately. Item six, 5.70 for a cab into the railroad station. And then item seven, 209.35 train fare. I boarded the Starlight Express only seconds before it began the long journey westward. And after settling down in my roomette... I suddenly realized that I had no proof at all that the man I was looking for was even aboard this train. However, a $2 tip to a porter, that's item eight, took care of that. Yes, there was a man by the name of Slade on board, also in a roomette, just one car in front of mine. All right, now all I had to do was to make sure it was Tommy Slade. That he looked like the picture I'd seen at police headquarters, and more important, that he had the bronze urn with him. At cocktail time, somewhere out in the middle of Ohio, I joined the mob in the club and observation car, but I saw no sign of anybody who even remotely resembled the man in the picture. But then, as I walked into the dining car... If you don't mind sharing a table with another single gentleman, sir... I... Not a bit, steward. Fine, I can seat you immediately. Uh, this way, please. Take that table seven, Waldo. Amos, your table's ready for the check. Uh, do you mind if this other gentleman sits with you, sir? Why should I? Sit down, mister. Make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Uh, here's a menu, sir. Thank you, steward. Now, let's see. My uh, 
My name is Slade, Tom Slade. Well, how are you, Mr. Slade? My name is Harry Walker. Walker, huh? That's right. Going all the way to the coast? Yeah. What about you? Well, at the moment, I'm not sure. Are you making up funny? No, no, not a bit. I just haven't planned that far ahead. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? Me? Not that I know of. Why? Oh, I just wondered. Now, let's see what's on that menu. Yeah, you do that. And that ended the conversation. He didn't look up again from his food. When he finished, he got up without a word and returned to his sleeping car. I'd rather hope that he'd go the other way to the club and observation car to give me a chance to look into his roomette. Because this was the Tommy Slade, all right. No question about it. I'd simply have to bide my time and wait for an opportunity to get my hands on the urn. If he had it. And then somehow get off the train with it. Or, of course, if that opportunity didn't materialize... I could only pray for the best and follow him all the way into L.A. Well, after my dinner, I had a couple of brandies in the club car with a pretty little blonde who spoiled everything by having to go back and look after three kids you happen to have on board. And then I wandered out to the observation platform. The night was beautiful, unseasonably warm with a full moon that bathed the countryside in its pale, eerie light. This was quiet, peaceful farmland country. The smell of the clean, freshly turned earth had an almost intoxicating effect on me, and I dozed off for a while. How long I slept, I'll never know, because I was rather rudely awakened by a cloth or coat or something wrapped suddenly about my head, and then a blow on top of it that knocked me out. Oh! All right. Okay, now, buddy. Now you're going over the side. <laughs> flat on my back in a roomette. A completely unfamiliar but kindly old face looking down at me. Well, now, that's better. Much better. Who are... Who are you? I'm Dr. Springer. I think you're going to be all right now. You just relax and rest. There was no great damage done. I know. I'm afraid your head may hurt you for some time. You have a rather nasty bump there. What happened, Doc? I was hoping you'd be able to tell me that. According to the conductor, as he was making his rounds, he stepped out on the observation platform, and he saw a man leaning over you. The man said something about you apparently having fallen from your chair out there. Well, I hate to think of what might have happened to me if that conductor hadn't come along. What did you do, faint or what? There is a trace of alcohol on your breath. Now, believe me, that had nothing to do with it. Oh, how? Now, 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 why don't you just lie here until you feel better? And I'll drop by again a little while to make sure you're comfortable. Uh, Look, Doctor, does the conductor know who that man was? The man who was leaning over me? Well, I'm afraid he just shouted at the conductor and walked on by him so quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I know who it was. Thank you, Doctor. How much do I owe you? Not a thing, not a thing, my boy. Now, you just rest. And I'll drop in on you later. Right. Right. So, I rested. For all of five minutes. By the end of that time, I was all fired up to settle accounts with Tommy Slade immediately, once and for all. But as I walked forward into the next car, full of sleeping passengers, I realized I'd better take it easy, use my head. What there was left of it. And then I saw that the door of Slade's roomette was wide open. Not even the curtains were drawn across it. It was empty. Except... There in the corner, the heavy bronze urn. I glanced around to make sure I was alone, and then I slipped in, and I looked it over. The tiny crack between the lid and the body of it had been pried at, but it very obviously hadn't been opened. I was about to pick it up and carry it back to my own roomette. I thought you'd try this, Donna. Oh? 
But I'd ask you in here, Tommy, if there was room for both of us. As it is, if you'll just move aside. All right, drop that urn unless you want a couple of slugs in here. Oh, I see. You have a silencer on that gun. Huh? That's right. Well, that's good planning. Now, let's see if I can hear it through this door. I'll kill you. Oh, that slug must have been the armor-piercing kind. It came all the way through that door and narrowly missed me. That one was too close to the lock. But the train was slowing down. Now, listen. If you think it's easy to break through two layers of a Pullman car window, well, it isn't. As for climbing out through the jagged glass loaded with that hunk of bronze, but somehow, I made it. <laughs> Item nine is $184 transportation. That means a few miles by car, a train to Pittsburgh, PA, a plane to New York, another to Hartford, and finally a cab to my apartment. Well, after cleaning up and changing my clothes, I got in my car and I drove to Mercy Hospital, the urn wrapped up in my top coat. Item 10, there in the lobby, a dime for a phone call to police headquarters. And then I went up to Standish's room. Mr. Dollar. Oh, is that it, Mr. Dollar? Wrapped up in that coat? That's it, Mr. Stanley. Good, good. I told you I'd pay you well for his return, and believe me, I will. I think you'll pay all right. What? You see, this urn and I had a little accident on the way back here. Accident? Sort of a train accident. I mean, when we left that Pullman car, one of the wheels almost cut the urn in two. But it didn't, uh... uh but the, uh... The, the money didn't fall out? Not the money or anything else. Oh. The cap flew off, and it jarred loose the top of the false bottom that you have on it... Too bad, huh? I'm... Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't understand you. I'm afraid you do, Standish. No, no, Just really, lie I don't... there quietly in that bed. Now, you said there was a lot more than just 5,000 in the urn, didn't you? Now, Dollar... Made a living it. in Oriental imports, huh? Well, that is the understatement of the week. You made a fortune is more like it in one of the foulest, filthiest rackets in the world. Now, look, Just there, you d- stay there, Standish. You're still a sick man, remember... Remember, huh? You said you couldn't remember what Tommy Slade went up for. Well, I remembered. And that's how I knew that you had turned to his caper when you got out. I, what I happened? What Were you holding out on him? Is that why you had to come all the way in from the coast to get the urn away from you? Will you listen to me, please? It's no wonder that you didn't dare go after him yourself. He knew you. He would have spotted you. would have killed you. As who wouldn't for a kilo of the stuff in the false bottom of the urn? Two pounds of it. Pure, uncut. And wholesale, maybe eight or ten thousand dollars worth. But carefully cut... To individual fixes, you'd probably get a million, maybe even more than that, for this much heroin. Yes, heroin, you dirty, rotten, filthy son of... All right, Sergeant, take over. Interesting sidelight on the case. I saw in the afternoon papers that the railroad company didn't look too kindly on Tommy Slade's little act... I mean, when he was caught standing there, blasting away at the lock on the door of his roulettes. Come to think of it, I'd better tip the federal boys to his having gone back to his old racket. Expense account total, $418.15. And no padding on this one. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Starring Bob Reddick is written by Jack Johnstone. Produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Heard in our cast were Ralph Camargo as Philip Standish, Ralph Bell as Tom Slade, William Mason as Toby Tetrick, Jack Grimes as the police sergeant, Bill Smith as the doctor, and Sam Raskin was the steward. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Sandrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to the great detectives of old time radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, I I thought Reddick did a very good job. It's a different take from Bailey's, to be sure. One thing that stands out immediately is that Reddick is a younger actor, and his voice portrays a bit more youth. The series went from having a lead who was 47, but a one who's 35, and I think that is reflected a bit in the voice. And there's also kind of a John Lund quality to him but still i think you've got a little bit of that warmth from the bailey era still continuing to uh, transmit plus i think some good action scenes here and, and probably better action scenes than we've heard in many a day uh, from uh, yours truly johnny dollar also while we lose a lot of the really familiar hollywood character actors we've grown to love and enjoy on uh, johnny dollar from hollywood uh, the new york move does offer some benefits as we hear er, ralph bell who's definitely a welcome addition and the story itself is well written and definitely sets a, a very good tone for this new era it's not Bob Bailey, but I liked it, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. All right, well, that will do it for today. If you do have a comment, send it to me, Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>